Hi, my name is Olivia Kratz. I'm Molly McElhaney. I'm Chris Sheehan. I'm Rebecca McGregor. And I'm Taylor Bobby. And we're the thesis group for Dr. Reed's class. So, okay, imagine with me, if you will, that you're learning to dance with someone. And as you're learning to dance, your movement patterns matter. If you move in the wrong direction, that's a mistake. So you become very sensitive to your movements and the movements of your partner. In this year's thesis, we wanted to see if pigeons have the same ability to be sensitive to their own movements. When you're learning to dance, your movements are initially controlled by your instructor's guidance. But after some practice, you develop the ability to complete the movement without any instruction. We say that practice with any skill makes perfect. But how does this happen? What occurs during practice that your ability to complete the dance is no longer controlled by your instructor's guidance, but by your own practice cues? In last year's thesis, we saw that pigeons develop autonomy with a skill through practice and that they can juggle two of these skills at the same time. But most importantly, we learned that development of autonomy doesn't always occur through the transfer of stimulus control from a guided to a practice cue, but also through the development of an entirely new behavioral unit. This year, our objective was to use discriminability data to measure kinesthesis and determine if the sensitivity to movement is being used as a practice cue. We manipulated the direction of movement and eliminated guiding cues, forcing the pigeons to rely on other cues that should develop through practice. So here is pigeon 33 in his apparatus. We have four of these total in the lab. The three arrows up here are pointing to the buttons or the keys that will light up to indicate to the pigeon when to peck and they can appear either red, white, or green, and I will explain the significance of the colors in a moment. So after a correct two-pack sequence, reinforcement is delivered through this window below. And after 70 correct two-pack sequences and 70 reinforcements, the session is over. So all pigeons completed one session each day for the duration of the experiment. So in our experiment, we used eight pigeons. Four were placed in the reverse group, and four were placed in what we named the move right group. These names were chosen based on the first condition that the pigeons were exposed to. Um, so our experiment was divided into four phases, and each phase featured a different condition for the two groups. So phase one um, was a signaled condition, so meaning there were two components, red and green, and each um, were presented randomly to the pigeon and both components required a different two-pack sequence to receive reinforcement. So first, the reverse group is exposed to the reverse condition. So when the red light comes on, it has to peck um, right, then middle, to receive reinforcement. When the green light comes on, it has to peck left, middle. And the move right group was then exposed to the move right condition. So when the red light comes on, it pecks middle right, and when the green light comes on, it pecks left middle. So note in the reverse group, they have to peck in two opposite directions to receive reinforcement, but in the move right group, they are always moving to the right. Then we introduced phase two, where we um, added two additional unsignaled, um, unsignaled components. So now there were four components total, all presented to the pigeons at random. Um, one red signaled, one green signaled, then one red unsingled, and one green unsingled. So all three of the keys are white. Um, and here we are interested in seeing how, without these red and green guiding cues, how the pigeons would still figure out which, um, which sequence to peck to receive reinforcement, how they would use their practice cues. <laughs> so then what we did for phases three and four is we switched the groups and the conditions. Um, so now the move right group was exposed to the reverse condition, um, signaled followed by unsignaled. So pigeons who have always gone in one direction, pecked to the right, now have to learn to peck in opposite directions to continue receiving reinforcement. Then we exposed the reverse group um, in phase three to the move right condition, signaled, then in phase four, unsignaled. So now the pigeons who have been um, pecking in reverse directions um, and have had more variability in their pecs, now have to learn to only move to the right to receive reinforcement. So here we hypothesized that um, order of exposure matters so that the um, direction of movement that they first learn will influence how they perform in these later phases. So what we have here now is the accuracy and discriminability charts for the reverse group and the reverse condition. What the accuracy chart shows us is the accuracy levels um, averaged every four sessions for the red and green components. The discriminability charts show us a ratio of hits to misses which calculated with using a logarithmic function where negative values show us more misses than hits, 
a value of zero shows us an even number of hits than misses, and positive value shows us more hits than misses. As you can see with the, the accuracy graphs of these pigeons, all of them show positive slopes, which shows that the pigeons were able to learn the movement patterns required for each component, and also able to juggle the skills better as the number of, sequence, number of sessions increased. We had to apply auto shaping for this group because pigeons 36 and 13 to 37 were not responding to the red component at the beginning of the condition. This just means they forgot that there was reinforcement provided within that component, but after auto shaping was given to them, you could see a steep increase in their accuracy. Now looking at the discriminability charts, you see all of them show a positive slope. And that just means that as the number of sessions increased, the pigeons were able to discriminate better between the components of which was the correct movement pattern for the red or green component. For the move right group, we again see that the accuracy levels show, all show positive slopes, again showing that the pigeons were able to learn the movement patterns required for each component, and that they were able to juggle the sequences better as the number of sessions increased. We had to apply auto shaping to this group because pigeon 45 was not responding in the red or green component, but after auto shaping was given to them, it started responding again. Again, we see this positive slope in each of the discriminability curves, and that just shows us, just as it did in the reverse group, that these pigeons were able to discriminate better the number of, as the number of sessions increased. In phase two, we, um, we added in the unsignaled component as well as the signal component. You'll see this in the accuracy charts by the lines that have the unfilled points. And in the discriminability charts, you'll see a red line with green markers on it, which is representative of the signal condition. And the black and white line indicates the discriminability in the unsignaled condition. As you can see in the accuracy charts, that all the accuracy for all components, both signaled and unsignaled, are very high, which suggests that the pigeons were able to remember the correct movement patterns within the unsignaled component and perform them in the signal component so, as well. The discriminability charts show us that the pigeons were able to discriminate between the correct movement patterns in, better in the signal component, but the positive slopes of the discriminability charts in the unsignaled components show us that they were able to perform the correct movement patterns in the unsignaled components as the number of sessions increased. Similar to the reverse group, we see more high accuracy levels within the unsignaled components as well as the signal components. And in the discriminability charts, we again see that the pigeons were able to discriminate between the correct movement patterns better in the signaled components. We also see that the discriminability charts all have positive slopes, again, suggesting that they were able to discriminate better between these components as the number of sessions increased. We just took note that the high accuracies for both groups in the unsignaled and signaled components show us that the pigeons were able to acquire the skills necessary and repeat them without the presence of guiding cues, suggesting that the knowledge they gained from phase one of the, the correct movement patterns carried over to the unsignaled components in phase two. So then in phase three, as Taylor already mentioned, we took the groups and we switched their condition. So here we have our reverse group in our move right condition. And so the behavioral sequence required in response to the green component is always the same. So that serves as our control. But the response now that produces reinforcement in red is different. So we can see the component looks the same, but a different sequence is required to produce reinforcement. So as we expect, we see consistent high levels of green accuracy because that sequence has not changed. All four of the birds in this reverse group started off immediately with low levels of accuracy for the red component. However, they all show these steady increases in the accuracy over time. And this has become very clear within our discriminability graphs, which show steady positive increases um, in these pos the positive slopes. We also see for three of the four birds a significantly higher number of hits to misses, indicating that even though this group was transitioned into a new condition in which they had to then figure out what other sequence would now produce reinforcement, they were able to learn that sequence and use that cons consistently to discriminate between the sequences for the red and green components. However, in the move right group and the reverse condition, we have a very different story. So two of our birds were rarely able to produce the correct sequence in response to the red component. The other two were able to develop the correct sequence, 
um, though it, they required more sessions over time to do this than our reverse group pigeons. So for these two groups, we are able to identify um, discriminability and graph and see the positive slips with higher levels of higher, greater hits than misses um, for these two birds. So the reason that we see such huge differences in the accuracy and discriminability between this group and our other group is that because this move right group has consistently had to move right. So this little variability in, this, in their behavior patterns locks them into the single direction movement pattern, which means that when they are then exposed to a new condition in which the most successful approach is to try different behaviors until they figure out which one produces reinforcement, they're so focused on this single direction movement pattern that they're unable to produce a different response, as opposed to our reverse group of birds that had to move two different directions. They weren't focused on a single direction movement pattern. There was more variability in their behavior, and they were therefore able to try enough responses and figure out what might produce reinforcement in the new condition. Then we shifted into phase four and added again our unsignaled components. And pigeon 36 and 1337 are actually still being run in this condition. However, for the other two birds, we do see generally consistent levels of accuracy across the four components, though we do see higher accuracy for some than others. Again, as Chris mentioned, we see higher discriminability for the signal components than the unsignaled components, which we did expect because of the design of this, this, those studies. And then if we move into the move right group, we see that, again, their behavior mimics the behavior in phase three. So the two birds that were unable to respond to the red component in phase three were still unable to do so in phase four. And the two birds who did develop the correct sequence in response to red did show high levels of accuracy for both the signaled and unsignaled red components, though not as high as their green. Again, we see higher levels of discriminability for the signaled than the unsignaled components, but because we still have pigeons being run in this condition, we can't draw conclusions at this time. So our current results supported the results from last year's thesis that pigeons can juggle two separate skills one sequence in response to the red component and one sequence in response to the green component. When we manipulated the way that the pigeons developed this autonomy, we were able to identify the cues and strategies that they used to solve this problem. The move right group struggled to adapt to the new component showed that they were very sensitive to the movement direction. As was hypothesized, the order in which the pigeons were exposed to either the move right or reverse group really affected their ability to adapt to the opposite condition. This supports the idea that the pigeons use kinesthesis as a practice cue in developing the ability to learn a new sequence. The pigeons' behavior can be explained by path dependence. Feedback from the first condition strengthened, strengthened their favoritism for one movement pattern. The inability of the move right group to adapt to the reverse condition provided evidence of this path dependence. When they learned that they had to move right first, it was very difficult for them to try and figure out how to move in the reverse direction. When the conditions change, the pigeons relied heavily on the movement of direction as a practice cue. We also found that during the unsignaled components, the pigeons may have been using pecs to the outermost white keys. Uh, those in the location of the colored keys during the signal component to figure out which sequence provided reinforcement during the absence of guiding cues. We plan to examine in the future whether these pecs directly precede the correct sequence, which would indicate that the, pigeon, the pigeons did use the outside white keys as a problem-solving strategy. Uh, we would like to thank Dr. Reed for, and this is him, we would like to thank him for and designed this experiment, holding our hands when we cry during throughout this process because of stress and being a great mentor. We'd also like to thank Dr. Steinmetz for her advice on cognitive competition. Are there any questions? <laughs> Chris used a phrase which I thought was something like, because something happened, we had to use auto shaping. Is that the right phrase? Is that something you do to the data or something you did to the pigeons? We ran the pigeons through auto shaping trials, which basically presents them with one of the guiding cues and the response is rewarded with a reinforcement. So it's a consistent, it just set, it's about 30 reinforcements and every minute the red key would come on and after a minute 
it would produce reinforcement. If the pigeon pecked at some point during that, then it would produce reinforcement. Even if there are no pecks, it would still shoot out one of the, um, the pieces of grain. So that way they learn that it is possible to receive reinforcement when that red is present. So we do start to see over time greater, um, greater pecks during those auto-shaping components. And even if they are not pecking, they're still learning that reinforcement is possible. And the, because the pigeons were actually completely not responding to red. They would just turn in circles for the entire red component. So we had to remind them that it is possible to do something in order to produce reinforcement while the red key is present. Yes? When you're switching them from the initial cue to the new cue, do you see a change in frequency in the, uh, in executing the old cue? So, as a, for instance, if I think something's supposed to work a certain way and it's no longer working that way and I try and do it over and over to try and get it to work, do you see pigeons doing that? There is. Um, it, generally the biggest thing that we can kind of see immediately once they transition into a new phase is that it takes them a lot longer. They can go from completing the session in 10 minutes to completing it in 25 um, because they are doing so many of those wrong sequences. So any, either the pecks to the colored keys or the, the white keys and unsignaled that would represent colored or a wrong two pick sequence produce timeout. So it lasts a lot longer because they're constantly being timed out. Um, I'm not sure we had any scenario though, except with our two birds that stopped responding, where, I guess not because they have green, um, where we actually did not fulfill 70 reinforcements once they started knowing how to peck. Because the computer every minute switches them between either a red or a green component, they're still, they automatically responded to green. So we still saw that they were producing, getting reinforcement throughout the session, um, but a lot of the wrong pecks during those red components and the transition were the incorrect sequence. Okay. What was the criteria for moving from one phase to the next? Um, so the beginning from phase one to phase two, um, we wanted to make sure that their accuracy had evened out. So you'll see if you look at those graphs that green accuracy and red accuracy basically converge um, into one point. And so it took them a lot longer to get to that point once we made sure that you know, they were there. So some pigeons took longer and others, that's why they're still in the experiment. Um, for phases two, three, and four, they were all automatically 10 sessions. So regardless of how well they were performing, they were transitioned after 20 seconds. Any other questions? How about a round of applause for all of our speakers?